Hello, everybody, um, and welcome to our next um, recorded video here. Let me try and hide this, friend. There we go. Okay, so um, in the last um, lecture, we looked at lots of the diversity within monocots, and we will certainly be returning to monocots when we do the very important order poeles at the end of the class is the grasses and friends. But now we turn our attention to the largest clade by far of angiosperms, the eudicots. Probably been on this rant before, but it is inaccurate to say that you can entirely define uh, divide angiosperms into monocots and dicots as it is often taught because of groups like the magnolids and all of these other groups kind of at the base of the clade. They are neither monocot nor eudicot. But now we are actually looking at the true eudicot clade here or group. And there's an enormous number of species within, within this, probably 75% of all described species are, are some kind of eudicot. They all share one feature and one feature alone. And it's a pretty hard one to tell without a microscope. That is that they are all defined by having pollen with three pores or three points in the outer um, protective surface that are, are weak spots where um, you can actually have, you know, emergence of the um, pollen tube. So they're called tricolpate pollen. Now, in general, right, eudicots are going to share base numbers of fours and fives, tap roots, net like venation, but there are going to certainly be some exceptions. Okay, within eudicots, the vast majority of species are going to be in the two big groups here the rosids and the asterids that we'll get to in subsequent lectures. So, rosids in general are going to have free parts. So like polypetalous here, rosids, you could peel them all off. And then the asterids are going to be more or less defined by a lot of fusion, sympetally or fusion within the whorls of that. But today we're turning our attention to this group at the base. It is not a clade, it's just kind of one-off orders spread along the backbone here of the phylogeny of the eudicots. Um, and they're going to show some of the kind of character states that are a little more plesiomorphic or primitive within the eudicots. And many of them are quite species rich in Colorado, but again, some of these things we're just straight up not going to talk about. So things like the proteales, the protea group, which is really important in Australia and South Africa, we just straight up don't have here at all. Okay, so what are we focusing on? Again, it, it cut through on that other phylogeny. We're really focusing on two orders, the ranunculales and the saxifragales that have a lot of representatives in Colorado. And in particular, these four families, the crassulaceae, the gratulariaceae, the ranunculaceae, and the saxifragaceae. Okay, so we'll start within the order ranunculales and we will focus on the ranunculaceae or the buttercup family. Uh, this is the largest family of this group of families that we're talking about today, the basal eudicots. There's over 2,500 species described in 60 genera. They are, the family does pretty much span the globe, but by far the majority of species are in temperate latitudes and cold regions, um, alpine as well in both the Northern and Southern hemispheres. So you really don't see this in tropical rainforests, deserts, places like this. This is a lot of kind of alpine spring wildflowers. Okay, so what are some of the defining features of the Ranunculaceae? Well, these are almost exclusively perennial herbs. So they're not annuals, though some species are, and they're not really trees and shrubs at all. So perennial herbs, the leaves are alternate and they're often divided or compound or palmately lobed. So you don't typically get simple leaves. There's at least something going on there. One of the key features to note um, in the field, when you see something that has kind of this buttercup 
roseate look. Maybe it's a white um, petals, yellow petals. Um, this is a family that's really easy to confuse with the rosaceae that we'll talk about. So instead of like getting bogged in the details of the flower right away, the first thing I look for is stipules present or absence. The ranunculaceae is going to lack true stipules, whereas the rosaceae is going to have distinctive stipules. Okay, beyond that then, the flowers have a lot of diversity. We're gonna see radial and bilateral symmetry evolving over and over again, lots of different pollinators. Um, some have um, really clear nectivorous rewards. Some don't reward with nectar, but have pollen for their pollinators. So lots of interactions with animals. Um, we will see some that jettison that for wind pollination. Now again, kind of keeping with our general trend of the evolutionary arc of the angiosperms, these have lots of stamen typically. So not the feature that we'll see in the asterids, which is like five or fewer. So lots and lots of stamens and lots of separate carpels. So I like this kind of four photo plate in the middle because it's showing like the progression, the opening of a ranunculus flower. And so I don't know if you can tell in this third photo here, there's lots and lots and lots of stamens. And then all of these like green, like leaf-like things fold in half, sealed up like a little envelope. Of course, each one of those is a pistil made of a single carpel. Here it is fleshed out in fruit. So you see we have lots of individual carpels made into a single pistil that are not fused together, other than at the base, of course, where they are attached. Um, here are a couple of our native species, Caltha, and one of our many species of ranunculus, the true butterclubs. Here's uh, some other beautiful photos. Uh, here's Caltha leptocepala, one of the marsh marigolds. Um, some of these are pretty common in wetlands, and yet again, we're seeing lots and lots and lots of petals, and especially stamen and unfused pistils down inside there. One of the harbingers of spring is anemone patens, sometimes called pulsatilla patens, or the pask flower, pask meaning Easter. This is one of the very earliest bloomers here in the foothills uh, ecosystem in Colorado. Big, showy, ridiculous flowers. Um, lots and lots of trichomes on it. Um, when they go into fruit, you can see really distinctively um, those individual pistils, which have kind of a long plumose appendage on the tip for dispersal afterwards. Some other key groups include clematis. Common name in English is the virgin's bower, but I'm going to start from PowerPoints here on including um, local indigenous names and uses for um, these plants. And I should say uh, class of 21 graduate Emily Rafiti did um, research with me last summer on all of this and she did an excellent job um, reading and incorporating and, and making a database of ethnobotanical studies with um, several of the key indigenous groups of this region. Many of these were rather old studies and she made this great database. So what's on the left here, so slender weaving plant, that is an ethnobotanist translation of the Navajo or Diné language, which, oops, sorry, um, is shown here, um, typed out as the best we can. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about general indigenous naming practices in a subsequent lecture. Um, but there's a lot of describers of what it looks like and what it's used for. And there are medicinal uses for this. There's quite a few species of clematis here in Colorado. Um, many of them are vining kind of clambering herbs with beautiful flowers. Uh, we do have one pretty bad invasive species that's in this group as well. A very strongly zygomorphic species are the delphiniums or the larkspurs. Okay, so I don't know if you can see this. Here is a petal spur. So one petal has this outgrowth and at the very tip of that spur, there would be one of those nectivorous glands producing simple sugars to reward pollinators. Um, 
These are beautiful wildflowers of kind of upper elevation montane areas, particularly where there's a good bit of standing moisture. And you can see that it has names and uses by the Shoshone tribe. Um, there are others that are like this, um, including Aconetum, and that actually, or Monkshood, that actually has some pretty um, important toxic compounds. Uh, Professor Kasunzu in um, organic chemistry here at CC, um, her PhD work was all on those secondary compounds within aconitum. So you can ask her about that when you take OCHEM. Okay, this is the Thelictrum fenlarii, or one of many species of the meadow ruse. Um, this is the one that's native to Colorado. Um, these are kind of understory herbs of the springtime. And unlike most of the other Ranunculaceae, they are not uh, with showy petals because they have jettisoned that to be pollinated by the wind. So this is a dioecious species with separate male and female plants. Um, and you can tell, you know, when they're in flower, which is which, and when they're in fruit, because of course only the females will produce fruit. Um, so we'll look for that when we're out in the field. And finally, the columbines. Uh, scientific genus is Aquilegia. Uh, we have several species here in Colorado. Our state flower is the blue columbine, Aquilegia cerulea, which is like a high elevation montane to alpine species um, with that very lovely um, light blue uh, sepals, actually. Here is a much more widespread species, Aquilegia canadensis, to illustrate what's going on there. So um, columbines have very showy sepals, but we would not call them tepals because there's a very distinctive dimorphism between the petals and the sepals. So you can hopefully see that the petal is much longer and has, again, that massive outgrowth at the base, a nectivorous spur. And there's been really cool studies that have looked across the diversity in Aquilegia at floral color and spur length. And kind of uh, the take home message for now is that short spurred blue flowers is sort of the ancestral character state within Aquilegia. And independently lineages evolve kind of the same suite of characters um, which is a shift towards red and longer spurs, actually moving from bee pollinated with a short spur to hummingbird with a longer spur. And then in some cases, even longer spurs and white to yellow flowers, which are pollinated by hawk moths. So there's sort of a unidirectional evolutionary trend towards longer and longer spurs and causing shifts in pollinators along the way. Okay, just wanted to quick highlight a couple other families of the ranunculales before we move on that are of regional and kind of global importance. The Berberidaceae or the barberry family, um, I've probably shown some, some of these to you on campus. Um, this is the Oregon grape, though of course there are names uh, by the Ute people and the Navajo as well. Um, this is a understory in um, kind of shrub in far drier areas, frankly, than where we saw a lot of the um, buttercups. And they produce um, edible berries that are medicinally important and also are one of many components of pemmican, which is a kind of catch-all name for mixtures of oftentimes meat, berries, um, fruits, other things like that um, by various indigenous uh, groups. So high in vitamin C, very flavorful uh, fruits there. The other family I chose is the Papa Varese or the Poppy family. Um, we have some in the greenhouse that I can show with you. Um, globally, this is a very important family, certainly for horticulture, but especially for opium and heroin and has had, you know, massive <laughs> implications globally and historically, um, thinking back to, you know, the opium wars and China 
and everything up to today related to that. Um, we do have native species of poppy here in Colorado um, that will bloom kind of in late spring, early summer. Um, and they have a very distinctive capsule that has little openings that are dots. So it's called a porocidal capsule. And that is the distinctive fruit type of the poppy group. Okay, now we are going to move on to the Saxifragales order. And we will start with, mm, let's say it's my favorite family in Colorado, the Gratiolary Aceae. Now it's not a very important family worldwide. There's literally only one genus, gotta love that, Ribes and 150 species found at very temperate latitudes. So if you look at this um, map, you see the majority of it is in the north temperate latitudes, not so much in the southern hemisphere, though there's one very exciting uh, group of species that's speciated throughout the New World, especially in the Andes, um, but really no, no species in the Old World temperate and tropical in the southern hemisphere latitudes. Okay, so hopefully we've all seen these in class, right? Um, this group has lobed leaves, not fully compound, but actually lobed. When they have distinctive inflorescences, it's a raceme, which is a type of indeterminate with branching, and fleshy fruits, very important uh, fruits for people and animals. Common names in English are the currants and the gooseberries. So floral formula for this friend, we've seen this before, is this is one of the groups that really has a hypanthium as a very key component. So a base count of five and the line under the calyx corolla in androecium is showing some fusion at the base into the hypanthium. Um, the sepals tend to be larger and the petals tend to be smaller and they both tend to be sort of showy, at least at some level. The gynoecium is inferior and is composed of two fused carpels, which is sometimes easy to see. So they're showing that cup-like hypanthium there. Now the difference between currants and gooseberries is, is real. So currants, um, ribes in the current group have a long dangling raceme, so a branching inflorescence, multiple flowers. Here's some examples of that. Uh, certainly very important medicinal plants, currants, uh, lots of uses of that in Europe in particular. And then the gooseberries. So gooseberries have a much shorter inflore inflorescence, paired flowers, and oftentimes the stems are spiny, though we've seen in Colorado with some of the ones that we can access, they don't actually have spines. So here's two of the many local species that we have, Ribes cerium, um, a very common shrub in the foothills ecosystem. Uh, common name in English is the wax currant, but there are names uh, from the Navajo, Arapaho, and Shoshone people. Um, again, there's going to be lots of uses of the um, berries for food, lots of medicinal uses, particularly from the roots. Um, some are used, uh, the wood is used to make arrows, etc. And then the golden current Ribes arium. Next family is the Crashulaceae. And uh, if any of you love succulents, like little houseplants that are succulents, maybe you own some of these or seek to own them. This is a you know, medium sized family, 34 genera, 13, 1400 species, um, found both in kind of cooler temperate, but especially warm temperate regions of the world. So again, not very big in the tropics, but this is much more able to tolerate xeric or dry conditions than the plant families we were just talking about. Um, here is one of our native species, Sedum lanceolatum, or the spear leaf stone crop in full bloom. And it's got those kind of succulent leaves kind of oppressed to the stem down there and then star-like flowers. Um, so lots of succulents in the leaves. If you can think of a jade plant, that's an example of that. 
So you've probably learned about CAM plants in intro botany, but maybe you don't know what CAM stands for. It's crashylation acid metabolism. And the first word indicates that this very important variation on photosynthesis to um, enhance um, water use efficiency um, was first discovered in this plant family. Um, there are lots of um, important areas of diversity for this family, particularly in areas, again, with that Mediterranean climate, especially the Canary Islands. So lots of our um, really cool succulent plants that we might love often come from these areas with um, low summer moisture and winter, and then high winter moisture, Mediterranean-like climates. Okay, floral formula on this. We do not have a distinctive hypanthium. Again, a base of five, very, very eudicot. Uh, 10 anthers, that's an important thing to look, like, look at. So it's not like lots of them, it's always 10. And it's superior gynoecium with five carpels. So we've seen two and other numbers previously today. This is one with five. Uh, the number of sepals is actually variable between species, so that's kind of a thing to note that can help you key things out. As with the groups we're talking about, again, those carpels are going to stay separate, the five carpels that make up five pistils, and a distinctive fruit type for single carpels that split open at maturity that are dry is a follicle. So they're gonna look like little stars. Maybe you can see that in like this flower here of sedum acre. So there's like one, two, three, four, five pistils, each is which of native one carpal that will split open at maturity, a follicle. Um, again, lots of animal interactions here. There are specific nectary scales or little bumps at the base of each carpal, which are producing nectar in there. So lots of insect pollination going on here. So probably, mm, let's go with definitely my favorite uh, genus of Crassulaceae here in Colorado are rhodiolas. Um, there are several species of rhodiola uh, found in Colorado and these are in the alpine tundra. So above tree line, and this tends to be one of the taller plants in those habitats. Um, and it's usually in areas with a little bit more standing moisture. Uh, the common names on these are queen and king's crowns. They have just this beautiful reddish to pinkish um, color on all aspects of the flower. They're really, really stunning to see kind of in the midsummer and high elevation habitats. And finally, we have the Saxifragaceae. Um, again, a very much a north temperate story, though it's much more species rich in places like the Himalaya than Saxifrag or than Crassulaceae is. Um, they're very similar in some ways to Crassulaceae. Sometimes I have a hard time telling those apart. Um, Many of them have this overall kind of form. So they're herbs, right? And the leaves are going to be basal. We've seen this um, in other groups, right? So you have lots of leaves, short shoots, simple leaves, right? And then you have a long scape leading to an inflorescence. So here's kind of a line drawing of that and then a photo of the, of the genus Saxifraga. Here's one of several of our local wildflowers, Saxifraga bronchialis. Um, many of these, again, there's endemic species to the alpine um, and down into the montane as well. Um, this group is going to have a slight hypanthium. It's not going to be nearly as distinctive as what we see in like the Gratulariae, see some of the Rosaceae. Um, but it is definitely a thing to look for. Again, base number of five. Um, the single pistil though is the way you're really going to tell it from the Crassulaceae. And is a single pistil made of two carpels. So if you see in the middle, there's kind of like a double green bump here. Maybe you can see it on this one here. 
and then there are two styles coming out of it, so a bunny ear. So that's going to be the main way to tell the Saxifragaceae from the Crassulaceae in general. Also the Hypanthium, if you can see it, but boy, it's just not very distinctive in the ones that we're showing here. Um, here's one that is much more distinctive, Mitella or the bishop's cap. These are kind of ephemeral, early summer, um, understory in montane, kind of wet habitat, um, beautiful little flowers. Um, so you can kind of see maybe a cup there. Um, one genus that's particularly important is Euchara or the alum roots. This is Euchara parva flora shown here. Um, Various gardening plants are in the Euchara, sometimes called coral bells. Um, it has that very kind of lobey leaf there. Um, and it definitely would have the tiny little flowers with the hypanthium. So we'll dissect some of those in lab. And just finally, before we leave this group, I wanted to show you just a few other examples of some plant families you might have heard of that are in the Saxifragales. So the peony family, the sweet gum family for all my southerners, both of those, shout out to my southerners. And then the witch hazel family, Hamamelidaceae, uh, which is very important medicinally. Okay, and that is that for right now. How do I stop? Oh no, how do I stop? Quick, leave. I don't know how to stop my meeting. I, oh no, oh my goodness. Stop watching while I deal with all this. Okay, I shut off the thing. Okay. Show me, oh, I show many controls. Okay, stop share, <laughs> end 